girls in Africa for uh, thank you, June. Um, from around uh, 90 countries uh, across the globe, uh, so majority of the world is looking at Africa, next frontier and whatnot. Um, a part of why ACES exists or how we operate is to support ventures. It is to support and to catalyze funding for early stage ventures in Africa. Um, and over the past 10, in fact, 11 years um, through the VC4A showcase, uh, we have managed to catalyze the funding uh, for about 126 ventures. So progress being made um, and not just conversations being had. Um, as ACES, our four main objectives, uh, just to kind of highlight and set the scene in terms of what we do and why we do what we do. Um, again, first of all, it is to increase the pool of capital available. It's not just to open up conversations, but it's to encourage people to open up their pockets and encourage uh, global funders to also look at Africa and uh, make early stage capital available for the innovation happening on the continent. Second, it's to provide opportunities. It's to provide not just the platforms to connect, but also the programs through which to collaborate, right? We aim to be able to provide those collaborations uh, through various opportunities through which we're also going to be empowering investors. And those opportunities being events, so events like these ones for learning of the technical skills, communities of practice, um, and events like others that are coming up, for example, if you're familiar with our investor meetups or the summit, um, but using those opportunities to really uh, garner the learning side about empowering the actual investors who are on the continent and in terms of how do we build a way forward. And then lastly, I think our aim is to contribute, to contribute and to influence policy discussions and to bring forward, bring into the conversation the relevant regulatory bodies, the government bodies, who else should we be bringing to the table that can help to open up the conversation about how do we promote early stage investing on the continent. Right. And the media is part of what I'm going to do, at least for this evening, um, is just to walk you through. So what do we have planned as the actual ACES team? Um, we have a few different touch points. If you're hoping where you're going to find us or what we're going to be doing, uh, the first is called the ACES Academy, which is exactly this that we're at. ACES Academy is our series of virtual events that are going to be happening monthly. And this is where we're hoping to be synthesizing the actual community of practice and the conversations, um, not just kind of unpacking the research, but also really bringing in the partners uh, to bring the technical knowledge sharing into the space. We're going to be sharing this conversation, um, not just live on Zoom, but also the recap of this conversation on these conversations rather will be available uh, on our YouTube channel, but also via our podcast so that you can be able to kind of listen to this conversation and pick up on these points uh, at any point in time leading up to the summit. The second point is our investor related partner events. So we, as a community that cultivates, I think, sorry, curates, uh, information for uh, the investors are hoping to be able to share more investor facing and investor involving activities. So if you have a deal day, a deal showcase, if you have uh, investor facing eventing that is happening leading up to the summit, our aim is to continue to connect our community with intentionality to make sure that more collaboration is possible leading up to the summit and not only once you've met people in person and at the summit, right? Speaking of in-person meetups, then moving on to our investor meetups. So if you're familiar with ACES, we have meetups about a month or a month and a half prior to uh, the actual summit, and this is where regional hosts get to curate their communities, so their local communities, bring together people for a networking session, for a presentation, for an unpacking conversation. This year, we're having a bit of a roadshow, so it's taking place over three weeks. We're going to be having 40 events that are going to be taking place, so hopefully in a city near you. Have a look in the comments at who has posted near you, add them on LinkedIn, and then keep an eye on when we're sharing the registration links uh, for attending the actual investor meetups. But those are taking place um, at the end of Q3, so at uh, the 30th, from the 30th, sorry, of September to around the 19th of October. Um, in about 40 cities, we're hoping to reach 30 cities on the continent um, and then 10 cities globally. So fear not, if you're in the US, EU, and even Asia, we may have a meetup for you. And if we don't, you can host a meetup as well. So there's that. Uh, and then lastly, um, the final touch points that I'll mention before I just kind of hand it over um, is our annual summit. So we have the annual summit happening on the 28th and the 29th of 
November in Cape Town. We are, I will put this plug in here very briefly, we are the kickoff event for Africa Investor Week, meaning that there is a stretch of events happening in the first, in the last week of November and the first week of December in Cape Town that if you are an Africa-facing investor, you need to be in Cape Town. And of course, you need to start off at ASUS. Um, So we are taking place, or our event rather is taking place the two days um, and will include you know keynotes breakaway sessions uh investor experiences which is super exciting we had really great experiences last year with investor dinners curated themed uh and we're having those again and then uh deal showcases and then we're also having more dedicatedly aces awards so this year we're hoping to close off aces with a big bang in terms of honoring the members within our community and within our ecosystem um, and give them that shine. Who are those people that have been uh, your MVPs, your most valuable players, connecting you to the deals, reviewing the deals. Uh, you kind of have their ear, you have them on WhatsApp. If they show you a deal, no questions asked, you're jumping in. Uh, we're making, it, I think, a bit of a dedicated effort. Uh, to shine a light on those members of the community and to close off our celebrations this year, I think, on that high note. Um, and so, yeah, I think as we move forward, uh, this is my cue to jump off uh, so that we can move to the true uh, crux of the conversation, which is the roundtable. Uh, so, yeah, thank you very much. I'll be back later with the closing announcements, but uh, take it away, Flo. there we go awesome thank you so much ayanda it really does sound awesome what we have um lined up for um the rest of the year in aces of course culminating in the uh, summit at the end of the year welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us i did spot in the list of attendees quite a number of longtime friends of aces some investors who are also themselves hosting investor meetups this year. It's really good to see you. And we do hope in fact that we will see you at the end of the year, 28th and the 29th of November at ACES in Cape Town. Looking forward to sharing a coffee and hopefully a glass of wine. So um, um, the theme for um, uh, ACES 2024, it revolves really around pioneering pathways and innovating capital allocation in Africa. Essentially, uh, considering that we had a number of years, so, uh, around 10 years of bullish growth, which peaked in 2020, 2021, 2022, where we saw really aggressive growth in venture funding across the continent. We also have, and are probably right now still in a bit of a funding winter, we've seen, where we've seen a significant drop in capital allocation. And um, what, uh, particularly given the theme that we have, we had last year of 10xing early stage investments in Africa, we really are keen to look to what that, what does the future look like after this funding winter. So today's session really is um, uh, meant to highlight more directly the necessity to innovate in our ecosystem and emerge the, opp the different opportunities that are available to do that innovation, whether that is in the kind of capital provider models or whether that is in the types of instruments that are used to invest and really highlight different initiatives. And I, 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 our guests today have done a, a quite a quite a bit of work in that area where they have uh, collated information that can um, inform us what is happening in the ecosystem and how we can more intentionally and deliberately collaborate to ensure the sustainability and the um, growth of the um, uh, early stage investing ecosystem in Africa. So um, I will ask by, uh, uh, I'll start rather by asking our guests to introduce themselves. And at the end of the conversation, before we close, there will be an opportunity for you as the audience to ask your questions as well. We will be able to air them to our, to our guests for you. And of course, uh, kind of helping you understand how you yourself can more intentionally collaborate with colleagues and the rest of the attendees here for the sustainability of our ecosystem. Right. So... To kick us off, my name is Flo. I don't know if I've introduced myself already. I'm the uh, content and speaker lead and in the ACES team. I'm going to um, let our speakers introduce themselves now. Maybe Elizabeth, we can start with you. Please let us know who you are and um, what you do in your organization. 
Thanks so much, Flo. Um, thanks for putting this together. Super exciting to see the, the focus of this year's ACES and um, certainly right up my alley because I uh, wear multiple hats in the local capital mobilization space. Number one, I work on regulations for investment crowdfunding um, across a number of African markets. Number two, I run a, an investor network of about 280 senior female investment professionals from across the capital spectrum, from very innovative intermediaries all the way up to DFIs. And um, thirdly, I'm, I'm the CEO of the African Crowdfunding Association, which is another industry body. Um, so yeah, happy to talk about um, sort of the cutting edge of, of, of where we are, um, our current best thinking on, on local capital mobilization. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, uh, uh, Lucas, maybe you can jump in next. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Lucas Robinson. I'm with Renew Capital. Um, I'm I'm in Ottawa today, actually visiting family, but generally based in Nairobi. Uh, so um, uh, afternoon to all of you on the African continent. Uh, sorry to hear about the weather in in Cape Town. A you you're getting a rare taste of the re of what the rest of us um, have to put up with on a regular basis, I guess. So. Um, uh, I'll, I can say a bit about Renew Capital. We're a we're a pan African venture capital firm. Uh, we're focused on investing in tech enabled African startups. That's that is our like quite narrow focus. Um, last year we invested in about twenty companies. This year we hope to to double that number uh, to to a roughly forty uh, investments. I suppose what makes us a little bit special is our um, what we call a, our blended finance model, which in our case is on the one side, we we have private capital, which is our investment wing, funded mainly by angels, family offices uh, from North America, Europe, Africa, the Middle East, Asia, increasingly. Um, and that's the at-risk capital. That's the that's the money that goes into startups in Africa. And then on the other side, we use more traditional international development grant finance to fund investment readiness programs or um, yeah, uh, startup or SME training programs to to kind of build. Uh, or or help to build. Uh, we we don't pretend to do it ourselves, but um, to build up ecosystems to to kind of prepare companies to receive outside investment. Um, uh, and so that's our kind of that's our blend. That's that's how we that's how we run our that's how we run our firm. Um, yeah, that's us really. Excellent. So there'll be more questions. <laughs> Great. Um... And you have a neighbor. Our next guest, Brenda, is also based there in Nairobi. Brenda, hi. Hi, Flo. Thanks for having me. Uh, dialing in from cold Nairobi, so I'm here with my cup of tea. <laughs> I think there's like a winter going around. Um, but yeah, I'm Brenda. I lead our portfolio work at Madika. And Madika is a pre-seed fund, at the inter uh, more like the intersection of your tra traditional VC fund. Um, and our model sort of like meshes also the best of the ESO world, which is like the accelerator venture building models. And so mm -hmm. our approach is we invest upfront uh, to up to 200K in companies. And then we offer structured support for a period of 18 months. Um, the fund has been in existence for uh, slightly below two years. Um, we've done four investments. We're closing our fifth. The goal is to get this number to 30. And yeah, I'm happy to share more about what we have learned using our approach. Um, but yeah, thank you for having us. ACES is also a friend to Madika. Uh, we were able to join the last um, installment last year in Cape Town with our portfolio, and we hope to do the same this year. And yeah, happy to be here. And yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Maybe we can, in fact, extend the conversation a little bit. Um, Brenda, you spoke of a more um, a platform approach to allocating capital. In essence, um, 
supporting innovators or founders with more than just money. Can you kind of speak a little bit to that besides what has motivated you to go down that route? But how do you see that in the context of doing things in an innovative fashion in the ecosystem to drive that sustainability? Yeah, thanks, Flo. Um, I think we can all agree at this stage at which most of us operate in, which is the very early stage, founders need more than capital in order to succeed. And I spent the last, um, you know, one year working very closely with our founders and getting, you know, feedback on like the things that they're, you know, they're learning as they build their businesses, both as individuals and, you know, as a corporate, as a corporate. And a lot of the time, you know, what, what we've gotten feedback on, you know, what is helpful is structured mentorship and really intentional mentorship. And so what we do at Madika is we work with a select group of mentors who have been operators, you know, have run corporations, have been part of like, you know, legal teams and, you know, in different, in different capacities to support them along their journey. And they do this through, you know, technical strategic advice, but also tactical advice on, on how to do stuff. We also have an aspect um, of, you know, community as part of our work. And as a founder, it can get really lonely. And there's a lot of people out there who are intentional about supporting founders. And so what we also try to do is to build this bridge between our founders and, you know, the startup uh, community that exists. You know, ACES is, is part of this. So we got to go to um, to Cape Town last year to be part of ACES. And our founders had access to, you know, the sessions, the investors who, who were there. And we got to also visit a couple of, of folks who are based in, in Cape Town who are much later stage that our founders could learn from. And there's also building a business requires a lot of things. And, you know, either it's products or services, we're also very intentional about creating deals and discounts that our founders can have access to so that it helps, um, you know, take some few zeros off uh, on like some things they might have budgeted and then we also now support them on like thinking through, you now have saved this money, how do you reallocate it? And so our approach is really to think about um, holistically in terms of like the support that we we provide. I think actually the last thing I wanna mention um, is we, we look at it in, in two buckets. So one, as, as, a, as a founder, um, how are you doing with your wellness, your leadership skills mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And so we curate um, sessions with executive coaches who are able to support them better their leadership skills. And then on the other end is the business. How is the business doing? So we're very intentional about setting um, setting milestones with them, reviewing them, seeing what went well, what didn't go well. And yeah, so four companies in uh, 26 to go. We'll share more lessons when, as we get more companies. Awesome. Awesome. That's fantastic. And I think it is an interesting view to bringing the element of not just personal development, but also that mental health and the overall care of the founder as the driver of the vision. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, uh, one of the um, objectives that Ayanda shared earlier, of course, is to grow the amount of capital that is available for innovations across the continent. And there is this view that there's, of course, a huge opportunity to grow global capital that is coming in. And alongside that, there's an incredible opportunity to grow significantly the capital of African origin, whether regional, multi-country, cross-country the intentional collaboration of capital allocators across the continent in order to create that. Um, uh, ooh, my screen has just disappeared. Is it just me? We can see you, but it disappeared okay. on me too, but yes. <laughs> came back. So um, in fact, what I wanted to ask Elizabeth, you, you've been fairly exposed to the various investment instruments that are uh, being utilized across the continent. And you've, of course, had a view of how that works when investment needs to move across borders on our continent. But can you speak to really the um, regulatory environment and some of the considerations that um, investors should really take into account when they are thinking of innovating how they allocate capital? 
Thanks so much, Flo. Um, such a great question. So through the Women in African Investments Group, we have a lot of insight into the the vehicles, the fund vehicles through which capital is supposed to reach our, our SMEs. And um, I know that the the, the world of ACES um, and ABAN is around you know, tech and startups. Um, I kind of have one foot in that world and another foot in your bricks and mortar SMEs. And when you look at the the difficulties that these mainstream funds you know, that, that are compatible with, with DFI funding, right? Development Finance Institution funding. When you, when you look at the difficulties that they have in deploying small size tickets uh, of risk capital to, to these SMEs, you, you really have to um, do a bit of a reframe to say, okay, well, um, how are we going to get this capital to these, these local SMEs at a much broader scale, right? And with um, some research that we did recently, we, we knew that all across the continent, Africans were pooling capital from individuals into, into structures of, of all sorts in order to invest in SMEs. Mm -hmm. And that the this was a very, it's a very widespread phenomenon, right? You might have an ESO, an accelerator, an incubator that has a sidecar fund, um, but you also might have individuals that are coming from DFIs um, that have got a lot of pipeline that they know that they can't do, and they'll start doing an angel investing activity on the side, and that angel investment activity will, will, will develop. Obviously, structures like Renew are quite similar to that. They're coming from abroad. You've got Africans that are in the diaspora working for JP Morgan or World Bank and want to invest back home. They start setting up these structures. And when you look at those structures, um, the, these vehicles, you you really see the extent of innovation um, of uh, on the actual design of the vehicle, and you know the the VC slash venture builder model is one of them, and you you've got to kind of um, look at the instruments that they are using to effectively get risk capital into these SMEs, and we're talking about you know working capital products, we're talking about tech-enabled investment pr um, products, we're talking about innovations on the investment readiness side um, with platforms and whatnot. Um, we're talking about investment crowdfunding platforms, we're talking about any innovation that allows um, a reduction in the cost of doing a small size deal. Mm. And a lot of that um, innovation uh, on 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 the on the investment fund is what allows savings, so to speak, on the investment readiness piece, which we know is so critical to to a successful deal. Now, all of that activity across the continent is unregulated, mm -hmm. and if you look at the US or Europe, um, anyway, you, you'll have specific regulations for the pooling of capital in this way. In Africa, we don't have it by and large, so. Um, what I do is to try and work with African regulatory authorities, um, not to uh, create regulations that are going to make doing this type of thing even less viable, because let's be honest, it's extremely expensive for anyone doing it, but to actually look at the ecosystem as it is and the players and invite them into the regulators room and say, how can we regu bring regulations into the space um, that enable some of these very innovative local models to scale? Um, and by that, I mean, Instead of your 100 person WhatsApp group, you can now have an online investment platform where you can actually market those deals more publicly, just like you can do in the US, um, in Europe, and, and other developed markets. So, so that's the context of, of the regulatory work. And if uh, we want to talk more about it, I would definitely speak about the, the progress that we've made in Ghana. Ghana is the first country to have officially an investment crowdfunding regulatory framework that is really built from the ground up. It's not perfect, but it's very close to something that we believe is, is broadly adoptable and mm. lots more that space in East Africa. Mm. Oh, yes. We would love to hear more about that, of course, because we want to get quite uh, intimate with the detail of how we can get practical around implementing some of these things. But... Um, um, let's chat with uh, Lucas quickly and really just to understand, and in fact, that one of the masterclasses that we're going to host as part of this academy is to a, um, a, just, a, and I, I want to say a conversation, but really it's practical training around when you are in a, a, somebody in the diaspora, you have an interest to invest in Africa, what are your options really? And what are the conversations that are happening 
among investors in the diaspora, whether it's individual investors or even large development organizations around what's the opportunity, what the risk is when investing in Africa? And yeah. what well, I can speak to it a little bit, although, um... I, I mean, it's a conversation I would welcome too. you know, like it's it's one of those topics that I think, um, depending which diaspora group you're referring to, um, it's a very different conversation, potentially. Um, and, and I suppose at Renew Capital, um, we, uh, we deal with a very small segment of those of that diaspora group, we, um, and and a very small segment of investors generally where we tend to focus on high net worth individuals that are mm -hmm. um that are investing in the continent um and 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 i think what you know elizabeth was just referring to is that i don't retail investing might be the wrong word elizabeth but you know that crowd level um or like bulk level investment potential which is really where we would love to see the 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 pendulum swing you know like that's when you start to see frankly real money um coming you know investment potential because uh you know the the odd dollar um from and i don't want to you know uh, downplay how how important the 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 tip of that iceberg can be to crack open um some of these investment opportunities can be um and that retail investors or crowd investors will even very often follow um but but that's what we need is volume right um the 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 300 people that Renew Capital deals with um, from a like high net worth investor um, point of view, uh, they for themselves would be the first to say, and I, I you know, um, and and I would say that that's that's their role is to be the tip of that iceberg and then to to break open the um, the the real flows of of capital onto the onto the continent, and I think. You know, the Elizabeth mentioned the regulatory piece from a crowdfunding point of view. It it's also true from a venture capital point of view that there's so many regulatory um, barriers, frankly, to um, the the investments that we would love to make. You know, um, to be very specific, there are, you know there are some countries that have an investment minimum of two hundred thousand, one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and that's a lot of money. <laughs> like, you know, that that's real, that's big dollars for some of these startups that um it's it, it's like, of course, they would love to receive $150,000, but nobody's going to invest that that kind of money into these very, very early stage um startups that that we're looking at. So instead, what happens is then grant funding comes in and Sometimes there's a really important role there, but um, very often it has a distorting effect. So, so from a regulatory point of view, there's so many ways that I think we could we could look to kind of improve the regulatory environment. One of which would be to um, to frankly do away with many of these investment minimums, which I think would have a a catalyzing effect from a venture capital point of view, but also from a retail or crowd kind of point of view, because, you know, a hundred dollars, just that you can't invest that in an Ethiopian startup right now. It's just, it's totally impossible. Um, and I would love to see that, that kind of thing change. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a good point all around. And um just to stay on the oh, excuse me <laughs> just to stay on the point of kind of the various platforms that can be a big enabler for a uh, aggregating and i kind of think i'm uh, reading mm. it right that there probably needs to be some mechanism of aggregating the smaller checks and some of the responsibility that makes early stage investing expensive it has emerged that the the a debt instrument has become quite an important tool when investing in early stage ventures. And to your point, uh, Elizabeth, there is that almost division between 
the early stage venture as a tech business and the SME as a smaller quote unquote mm. business. Well, we know debt has been used as an instrument to fund these businesses traditionally in any case. So what are we seeing in the ecosystem that's kind of telling us that actually there is a lot more movement in moving to instruments like debt that are more kind of accessible, that offer lower barriers, et cetera? Elizabeth, sorry, that's a, that's a question for you. <laughs> yeah, sure. No, it's, it's a great question. I think... Um... What's great about local capital is that it's in local currency. And if you have experienced the depreciations across the continent recently, obviously the demand for local currency debt has exploded. Um, when it comes to local capital mobilization, so crowding in these small checks, um, the feedback that we had in our research is that um, you know, debt is, is a sweet spot for a lot of investors, but it's often also the starting point to do bigger sized amounts and to get into the equity space. Um, the the people who are investing in local currency also come from the diaspora. They are not um, requesting hard currency returns. They're not requesting to repatriate their funds back to the US. So the exchange rate risk and the the, the tolerance for it is different for, for local investors. And they tend to have a, a sort of a three three year lockup, you know, sort of uh, patience level. Um, this is this is what we come across, but it, it does vary quite a bit. Now to the point of platforms and how do you aggregate them where we are on the African continent I think is just on the cusp of putting in place the incentives for that value chain and for those platforms to actually get developed With, without regulations okay so for, for everyone who's who's listening I know this is not a it's a point that I often assume and I don't explain when um, a private company so an SME or a startup goes to the general public and says hey I'm raising money um, they are in a regulated space, right? Individuals from the general public are not allowed to um, have access publicly to, to deals um, that are sort of marketed on Facebook, on LinkedIn. Um, there's, a, there's a bit of a debate about what's a 500 person WhatsApp group these days, but generally you're not allowed to go to the general public with a with a startup or an SME and, and make an offering um, for to people to invest in you. That is why you need regulations. You need special regulation that says, Okay, you can do it under some conditions. Without those regulations in place, all of these models have to kind of go under the radar, make decisions to skirt around regulations, call themselves some things but not others, and it 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 remains quite a fragmented and messy space. It's very hard as a retail investor to come into this world and understand what's that model versus that one. What's the risk of this? Or is that a lot of the jargon is imported from the US. We talk about angel investor, high net worth, sophisticated, safe agreement. The stuff does not have a lot, a lot of uh, anchoring in local laws and, and context. So this is because we don't have regulations. And, and once we have those things in place, we create new incentives for technology companies to come and partner up with venture capital funds, um, angel investor networks to create a value chain that enables the participation of these small retail investors. Um, I'm 100% uh, convinced that we're going to have excellent value chains. We've got amazing technology companies. We've got amazing payments companies. Um, we've got a lot of, of, of structure in ecosystems, particularly some of the more advanced um, markets, something about Kenya, Ghana, and um, what what we're hoping to see in in Ghana is is that that catalytic moment. So we're going to start producing uh, models that truly can bring in the scale uh, required. And that okay. into the model a little bit more, um, Elizabeth. Um, we had thought we would hear a little bit what you've learned from that model. So what was the first part of the question? Model in Ghana. Can you dive a little bit more into yeah, that? Yeah, sure. So. Um, in, in Ghana, we had the opportunity to work directly with the Securities and Exchange Commission of Ghana to put in place what we call investment crowdfunding regulations. Mm -hmm. um, and the approach that we took to that is particularly interesting for our, our early stage uh, investment space, because the version of investment crowdfunding that we advocated to the regulator for is not a version that allows the entrepreneur to go directly herself or himself to the general public and advertise the securities, whether it's equity or debt. But for 
an what we call an investment crowdfunding intermediary. So a Lucas or a Brenda. Mm -hmm. For them to go to the regulator and get a zero cost or a low cost license, hopefully quickly from the regulator, that allows them to take the top deals in their pipeline that might already have a few high net worth individuals, like Lucas said, it's the tip of the iceberg, mm -hmm. uh, who might already have a check from USAID or Global Affairs Calendar for something, some de-risking mechanism. And to open that deal up to retail investors under the conditions provided for by the regulations, to open it up for, for subscription. Um, that is that is the version of, of investment crowdfunding that we've we've um, put in the regulations in Ghana. Mm. It is not completely uh, impossible for an entrepreneur to go directly to the market, but that entrepreneur would need to follow other steps and get other approvals so that as a retail investor, you know that the investment readiness that you are relying on is of, of the highest quality possible. And I'll definitely I'll insist on this issue of investment readiness. I know Brenda knows what I'm talking about. I know Lucas knows what I'm talking about. And Stefan, <laughs> his video has just popped up. Um, if no, no matter the technology, no matter the regulations, investment readiness is a problem that doesn't ever go away. You you can't outsource it. You can't you can't make it go faster. It's it's expensive. It's hard, and someone's got to pay for it, right? And so if you uh, take a crowdfunding platform a piece of technology and infrastructure and you say oh just like in the us whatever it's the platform that's going to get the license the platform isn't going to do all the hard work of the investment readiness plus the legal plus the technology plus the investor relations plus plus the development it'll never work yeah. uh trust me it's hard. <laughs> oh, it yeah. is not, it's not viable. right yeah. so right it's it's just it's extremely difficult to make the economics work the the the, the vision is rather that we need to leverage these excellent investment crowd, potential investment crowdfunding intermediaries like Lucas, like Brenda, who are in the market and enable them to find a business model of getting capital at, at small tickets into these deals mm -hmm. and to use the, the technology and to use access to retail investors with your local currency, with your different risk return profiles and tolerances and, and horizons, whatever, to, to, to let the market find where those fits are. Um, and if they're able to do that, then they will better be able to do high quality investment readiness. Um, they've got to use technology across the rest of their operations so that they can really, really do what they need to be doing best, which is investment readiness. And mm -hmm. me as a retail investor, all I want is to make sure that my money has gone into a deal that's been properly prepared and that mm -hmm. this entrepreneur is not, is not only supported on a, a one-shot basis, but has a, an enduring relationship with someone who's strongly aligned with value creation in the company, which is exactly what Brenda and, and Lucas do. That's what I want to rely on. Absolutely. And as, a, as an individual in, investor, you don't necessarily have the expertise, nor the time, nor the finances to do that ticking and checking that everything is in place as it should be. It, it is a it is and and I mean I suppose Lucas it also speaks to the point that you made in that some of these VCs and global investors are keen on really large ticket sizes so potentially when there is that intermediary that um, uh, Elizabeth is referring to then that no longer becomes an issue and and I suppose it's not really that LPGP conversation necessarily is it where money cascades down yeah yeah. I mean, this gets into another challenge in some ways where, you know, we see our role and, I, and I'm sure Brenda is similar where we're, we're creating, you know, we're at the pre-seed seed stage generally, right? Like if it's rare that we would get into an A round, um, though it happens. But um, what we really want to see is, uh, is folks, is, is that entire chain starting to, to to see churn like positive churn and because we we all need wins basically <laughs> is the short story and like wins are what what are going to drive um more attention to investing on the continent whether it's from the tip of the iceberg angels as i talked about or the retail investors like you need attention positive attention um and so um 
and and wins come from like like uh, you know a seed getting an A round and then an A round getting a B round and a B round and you know right up the food chain. So so those DFIs that are in that are investing say twenty million or thirty million, um, like right 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 now what we're we're trying to kind of see and why and and why you need the investment preparedness um not just right at the start of the relationship but throughout the journey as elizabeth was just describing right it can't be that renew capital invests a couple hundred thousand dollars and then says we really hope you get an a round <laughs> because that will never work like they they won't be ready for an a round you have to that investment readiness process is a is a journey that starts with the pre-seed, then a seed, then, and you have to stay involved in a company um, through those A, B, C, D rounds, I think is is kind of been our experience and continue to provide, it's like training is the wrong word in some ways, but I don't know another way to describe it, to be a sounding board, to be what Brenda was describing of like, the mental health piece of this journey. Like we, we end up doing all things. Um, not that I have any skills in the kind of, uh, uh, mental health sounding board space, but just that that's what you end up at talking about with founders, right. To try to, to try to talk through the journey with them. So, so sorry, um, Flo to like, that's the long way of saying like where are the actors in this and the dfis and the larger ticket sizes like i do really want to see those ticket sizes come down into the kind of low millions and the the kind of like 10 million space to start to see more flow from the c to the a to the b to the c to the d and then great like go public and and launch on the nairobi stock exchange or the ghana stock exchange or whatever because it like we do need that too um yeah, yeah. so there's so many steps there's so many rungs in this journey all of which requires investment readiness i guess is my fundamentally like kind of where i see a role yeah, understood. And that's your game, Brenda. Um, so before I continue, please let, let, let me invite everyone to kind of put their hand up or put a question in the um, chat box so we can um, also ask our guests. We do have 10 minutes before we have to end. So maybe in the last minutes, I have a couple of questions that I want to ask you. Um, but let's have a look at a question from Stephanie Eboko. And congratulations, Stephanie, on 101 Capital. Maybe we'll have a chat again around uh, what you are hoping to achieve there. But Stephanie's question, in fact, might be for you, Lucas. She's asking whether or not DFIs are distorting the markets. And I imagine that might be from various perspectives. I think what you shared is more from the perspective of grant making, but we, also, we know also DFIs are LPs in a good number of venture firms in Africa. We also know that DFIs, some of them make direct investments into ventures and that kind of all kinds of conversations around valuations, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But you know, do DFIs distort the picture somewhat? I mean, the the dis like where to begin with distortions in some ways, like how it, like the norm is distortion in some ways. So it's it's sort of like where's the where's the normal path that is being distorted? I I would find it so difficult to say that the rungs are so many rungs are missing um, that I think it's very hard to say one particular group or another is distorting i'm sure an allegation could be made against renew capital in a distorting way in some ways you know but i will say that um my friends that work in four dfis themselves are deeply frustrated by the trend towards larger and larger ticket sizes that are further and further away from the core mission of development finance institutions um and that i think we we do 
you know, when when DFIs are asking for more warrants and more risk aversion um, tools to be included in their um, conditions for investment, then say a private bank, um, then I think and, and and higher interest rates even in some cases, then I think we 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 do have a bit of a challenge. So, um, I yeah. I, I distorting is such a strong word, um, but yeah. I I think uh, you know it's a really it's a really important conversation as a whole. Yeah, um, yeah, we we might in fact have an opportunity to bring that conversation at the summit. I think look out for when we share the agenda. Perhaps we'll be able to ventilate it a little bit more there. But maybe Brenda, I can bring you in here, given that. Uh, ACES, in its evolution from being an event where uh, investors come together to being a community with multiple touch points that where we are all kind of uh, pursuing the, the, the common objective as after focus early stage investors, well, what are you seeing by way of the types of collaborations or uh, opportunities to part to foster partnerships that will get us that momentum and the ability to um, to sustain the ecosystem going forward. Thanks, Flo. Um, that's a great question. Um, so before my work at, at Madika, I spent five years in ecosystem building, which when you meet people who are deep in the tracks, <laughs> will tell you can either be very thankless work or like very deeply rewarding work. And, you know, my thoughts on this are usually at the end of the day, when we gather at ACES or any other gatherings that we have, they're all aiming to support the entrepreneur and the entrepreneur has needs. And a lot of the time they adapt to the system instead of the system adapting to them. Like when you look at the African continent, you know, 54, maybe 55 very different countries in terms of regulations, in terms of population, in terms of like internet penetration and all that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the approach that we see when it comes to supporting entrepreneurs is usually like a one size fits all approach or even, um, you know, looking at more developed ecosystem, you know, the San Francisco's of the world, the London, uh, and trying to, you know, map that back into our ecosystem. But there are things that we inherently know because we, we have been through the education system here. We know how you deal with the government. We know how you deal with the taxman and all that. And a lot of this might not translate into the systems that already exist. And so I see this, you know, gathering that we have where we're able to collaborate with people, the most impactful ways in which we can support entrepreneurs is to help disrupt those systematic challenges that exist. That you know, if if you look at a pitch deck or like review an investment memo, they would look like a very good investment. But once the rubber hits the road, and you realize there's a lot of red tape that you need to to um to you know walk around. There's a lot of regulatory issues that might work for you and some against you. Then it just becomes like everyone's, you know, it's it's sort of like an army where Marika cannot do this alone, Aban cannot do this alone, or, you know, ACES cannot do this alone. It's important for us to have, like to come together to advance the ecosystem, but put the entrepreneur and the businesses that we want to support at, mm -hmm. at like the heart of it all. Yeah. Yeah, great points. Great points all around. We're coming to the close to a close of our webinar today, and we still want to give Ayanda a short opportunity to close. So maybe let us close off with one comment from each of our guests around what areas you are keen to collaborate with the community in and how people can reach out to you to do that collaboration. Besides, of course coming to ACES and having a coffee with you. <laughs> and um, uh, Elizabeth, maybe you can start. Sure, so collaboration is extremely important. It's the only way we, we're gonna get anywhere in this ecosystem. Uh, platforms like ACES are essential 
for us at the Women in African Investments Group, we're understanding how to use how how networks and even WhatsApp groups as a platform um, can catalyze what we call systems change and forging coalitions of ecosystem actors that are deeply connected to the purpose of the network. And in our case, it is to increase the capital that is deployed through women-led investment vehicles and funds. Um, selecting those ecosystem players that are strongly aligned with that mission and improving the conditions in which they have to work for their own sustainability um, and making sure that we are, are leveraging their resources to, to do the heavier lifts in the ecosystem is, is essential. So um, that model, that just as, as a sort of an operating model of WhatsApp group, network, systems change, ecosystem coalitions is something that we want to feed back into the ecosystem at platforms like ACES, show everyone what is our current best thinking, show everyone what, what we've managed to do, what we haven't. Um, and and give that to other contexts, right? We know that there are a lot of different heavy lifts in this space to figure out, but figuring out the actual, uh, the way in which we collaborate together is is, is important too. Mm, too awesome, too awesome. Um, Lucas, do you wanna go next? Sure, I mean, where to begin uh, on my willingness to collaborate? Like we we, we are a small firm that have, uh, like high hopes. So, um, but, you know, probably, probably policy in, and um, policy change is probably like the area that we see a lot of potential, but um, investing itself, uh, we, you know, our ticket sizes are kind of between like Brenda, you know, between 50 and 200, $300,000. So, we, we so rarely invest by ourselves in a company. And so sharing some of the costs associated with that, for example, due diligence is very expensive, often doubling the cost of our investment, frankly. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, if we can partner on on the investment activity itself, then we're, we're wide open. So um, those would be my two, uh, but, but really, as I say, uh, it's a long list. Yeah, super, super. Um, Brenda, go ahead. Thanks, Lou. I also have a long list. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, I'll, I'll share our website link, um, my email and my LinkedIn on the chat. Um, we're keen to have conversations with, you know, investors actually writing checks in the early stage. A lot of the founders that, you know, we come across are raising significantly more than 200k so if you're able to write checks that would help them you know move along we're happy to have a conversation then on the program side of things we've currently made investments in Kenya Nigeria Ghana and South Africa and so if you're based in any of those countries working a lot especially in the biotech space the e-commerce logistics we are happy to have a conversation to explore how you possibly could plug into all the things that we're building at Madika. And I think yeah. most importantly, see you at ACES. We will Indeed. be there. With, we will be there. So we hope to see all of you there. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. You guys have been wonderful, wonderful guests. And we will be chatting some more with regards to the summit, of course, at the end of the year, while, while we are in the process of finalizing that. That's, that brings us to the end of our webinar today. Once again, this webinar will be available on our YouTube and other socials. So you are welcome to go back and revisit. And when you have ideas to share with the team, we are really keen to hear. And of course, you will see in the chat, our guests have shared their contact details as well for you to get in touch. I'm going to hand over back to Ayanda for the last bit of announcement and closing our webinar. I really very much appreciate your attention and for you attending today. Ayanda? Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, Flo, thank you so much, Elizabeth and Brenda and Lucas. Um, as Flo mentioned, uh, the conversation is going to be made available. Fear not. Um, but just before you go, again, just a quick mention of what's coming up on ACES, uh, for ACES this year. So again, if you are hoping to attend an investor meetup or would like to host one, you don't know if one is going to happen in your city, put your hand up. We encourage you. Um, get in contact with Phil. Uh, she's our investor meetup's lead. Uh, we'll drop 
the uh, email address in the chat, but also if you go onto our website, you'll get an opportunity to be able to put your hand up for a city uh, near you and host an actual meetup between the 30th and the 19th of October. Okay. Second opportunity uh, is join us at the summit. Uh, I think it's never too early to book your seat. Early bird tickets are up, so you get a really good deal if you buy it now. Um, and you get an even better deal if you buy like a couple for like five or more people. Come as a delegation. Bring your people. Bring your community from your investor meetup to the summit. So um, early bird tickets are up on the website. Uh, if you'd like to just go on there and have a check out. Um, and then last, con last point. Give it to me, June. Yes, if you would like to be more involved in ACES. So like Flo mentioned, there is opportunity as we're building out, I think, the final elements of the program. Uh, if you feel that you are aligned with a lot of these conversations, if you feel you'd like to be a part of the ACES Academy conversations that we will be having monthly, I think feel free to reach out. There are a few different ways in which we can partner in activities leading up to the summit, uh, as well as at the summit at the end of the year. So we have our partnerships lead, Incremella Andrew. You can find her on LinkedIn. Uh, She's, she's linked on our LinkedIn, but also um, Ankramella at AfricaInvestorSummit.com. Um, and with that, I believe my announcements are over. So thank you so much once again, everyone, for taking time. Um, that hand up is just so that you can also ra raise your hand and uh, I can see who I'm going to be seeing in Cape Town at the end of the year. Yes. How many hands? How many hands am I seeing in Cape Town at the end of the year? There we go. I'm seeing hands. This must mean tickets in hand. Otherwise, it's meaningless, guys. Tickets in hand. <laughs> AfricaInvestorSummit.com. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. And have a great evening, everyone. Again, if you'd like to follow up on investor meetups, Phil's contact, we'll leave it on the screen. And if you'd like to follow up in general about uh, content in regards to uh, in partnership with Flow, uh, feel free to drop me a line uh, as well. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye. Thanks, so. all. Bye-bye. Thank you.